What's up everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. On today's Inning Explain, we're looking at Coherence, a reality-bending sci-fi flick where strange things begin to happen when a group of friends gather for a dinner party on an evening when a comet is passing overhead. Available now on Amazon Prime or Tubi TV to watch for free. This is another one that manages to accomplish a lot despite its obviously limited budget, which is said to be around 50 grand. The entire movie being shot in a measly five-night period, mostly improvised. Yet it is also able to craft a quite interesting and increasingly complicated story that twists things into many unexpected directions as more mysteries are uncovered about the strange things occurring. It is all grounded in at least some kind of theoretical science, which I appreciate as well, and makes us feel a lot more plausible despite its quite science fiction-y aspects. So let's check out Coherence, breaking down these stories, twists and turns, helping you keep up with the multiple realities and characters as well as how the comment is affecting things, and explaining the ending and what it means. We're introduced to Emily, whose perspective we stick with throughout, importantly, on her way to a dinner party. But this also happens to be the same night that the Miller Comet is passing by in the sky, and will turn their normal evening into something unbelievable and reality changing. On the phone with her boyfriend, Kevin, as she gets closer to the house, her phone suddenly cuts off, and the glass completely shatters out of nowhere. Although, for now, things are relatively tame, joining her other friends. And when bringing up her broken phone, she recalls the news mentioning the comet could have this kind of effect. But the others are like, eh, whatever, just use Skype if you need to make a call. Though there is a bit of juicy drama between the group, one friend, Amir, is bringing a lady, Lori, who it turns out used to date Kevin, her current boyfriend. And it seems that Lori has quite a reputation, referred as vixeny and wild and sexy by the others. Although Emily insists she's fine, writing it off as such an Amir thing to do. Dating your buddy's exes? Never a good idea, dude. Beth offers her an all-natural remedy to calm her nerves. You know, it's got normal stuff in it like rose water and other herbs. Oh, and a nice helping dose of ketamine, aka horse tranquilizers. Woo-wee, sounds like she's got a big evening plan here. Tranquilizers for all. The rest show up, including Mr. Playboy Amir and the so-called vixen Lori, looks just like a regular lady to me, not a man-eater like they were describing, as well as Kevin. And we come to understand that there's a big work trip that he's taking soon, and time is running out for Emily to decide if she's going to join him or not, her chuckling nervously that she needs to think on it some more. Kevin reminding her that not deciding is the same thing as saying no. Hugh, a big burly bearded bald boy, doesn't have signal either, asking the others, and no one does, assuming that the tower must be down, someone thinking it's actually the comet responsible instead. Yeah, that's right. Emily, a comet expert apparently, recalls a comet that passed in Finland in 1923 that affected the people, many getting lost and forgetting things like who they are. One lady even calling the police the next day about a strange man in her house. When they ID'd him as indeed being her husband, she refused to believe it as she had murdered her husband the day prior. Oh, well, that is strange. Guess you get to murder him all over again, lucky. Beth is more preoccupied with a so-called useless door, scolding them for putting a picture near it and feeling that something is off about the area's energy. This generally would all sound like some new age wackadoo nonsense, but in this case, this useless door will indeed become important later. They gather to catch up, Mike asking Lori if she's still doing yoga, but she corrects that that isn't her. Him apologizing for confusing her with another girl that Kevin and then Amir dated. Dang, Amir, you just picking up scraps, huh, bud? Mike is apparently an actor, the star of a show called Roswell, perhaps a kind of flip on the fact that Nicholas Brennan was in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Lori does know the show, but doesn't quite recognize him, thinking it must be his hair is different or something, and backpedals that maybe she's just confused seeing him in real life versus TV. Another person chiming in that he's a great actor, before things get too uncomfortable. When it comes to Emily, she is a dancer and was in the midst of creating her own show, and was going well until they brought in a renowned dancer to take the lead, in turn offering her the understudy role even though she created the entire thing. Because of her pride, she didn't want to be the understudy, and of course the big dancer lady backed out at the last minute, and the new understudy Catherine ended up taking the lead and went on to huge success. As another points out, she basically stole Emily's career. Dang, the world of dance is pretty hardcore, I had no idea. Beth, too, notices that her phone is shattered out of nowhere, and Hugh brings up his theoretical scientist brother, who asks to contact him if anything odd happened tonight, which proves difficult with no signal or landline, and the internet is out, too. Well, that is odd, but it's about to get a lot weirder. The power cuts out, plunging them into total darkness. They light some candles, and Mike retrieves a box of blue glow sticks, handing them out to everyone in the group. He notices that the whole 
block has no power, except for one house two blocks up, which everyone wants to check out. Wondering if they have a generator or solar power or something like that? And everyone looks up to the sky, seeing the comet passing by overhead. Back inside, they find a broken glass, but nobody saw it break. Seems like glass has a hard time surviving around the comet. And Hugh thinks that they should go to that other house, even though his brother specifically said to stay indoors and keep trying to contact him. But he feels that this is more important, getting a mirror to tag along, assuring them it's no big deal, they'll be back in five minutes. The truth being that this is actually the last that we'll see of these two for the entirety of the night. It's not as ominous as it sounds though. Back to M, the comet aficionado, she recalls another one that passed over Siberia and exploded in the sky, not even touching the earth, though its force flattened trees for hundreds of miles, getting startled by a loud knock at the bad energy or useless side door. Kevin grabs a bat and pulls back the curtain, yet there's nobody there, considering that it must be a prank by Amir and Hugh. They decide that they should go get them, gathering everyone together and the lights kick back on, Mike returning triumphantly, declaring that he got the generator going, let there be light, he exclaims. They sit down to take a breath just as the doorbell rings. It's Amir and Hugh, who now has a cut on his head, carrying a lockbox that they retrieved from the other house. They reveal they made it to the other house, rounding to the side, and saw something strange inside, but they don't elaborate any further for the moment. Importantly, again, this is not the same Amir and Hugh that left. We'll see exactly why that is later, but even they don't realize the mix-up at this point. Mike wants to open the lockbox, and inside they discover a ping pong paddle along with an envelope containing photos of everyone in the dinner group with numbers assigned on the back. Lori concerned that that means they're somehow marked. They keep pressing Hugh about what he saw, relenting he saw a table with wine glasses and dinner set for eight, motioning to the table saying he saw this, indicating the other house that they saw is actually Mike and Lee's, a copy of theirs in a sense. Kevin asks about the side door knock, yelling that it had to be him, but he refutes this, saying that when he went no one answered the door so that they went to the side door, adamant that they didn't go in a circle, but that still doesn't explain the pictures. As we can already start to piece together, it was Hugh that knocked on this side door a moment ago, but a different Hugh, just as our Hugh knocked on the other side door, a different one than was responsible for the knocking here. Wow, it's already getting complicated. It seems this other Hugh, or potentially yet another copy, is spotted outside, everyone concerned. Kevin retrieves his bat and pulls back the blinds, seeing a note left on the door, which upon reading is the exact same note note that Hugh is writing right now, further clarifying the other copies of people out there are doing the same basic things as this Hugh, but in a slightly different manner. They take another stab at understanding the pictures and numbers, thinking they might add up to something important, but are halted by another strange wrinkle. Amir noticing the picture of him must have been taken today, because he literally bought his sweater earlier the same day. He's even clearly in Mike's house in the photo staring right into the camera, and must know that he's getting his picture taken, but we haven't seen this happen. Yet, that is. Mike is growing tired of talking about it, and wants to see these theoretical other selves for himself. And Emily and Kevin decide to join him. Outside, they notice there's no cars or people or anything, really, and they keep going, Mike immediately recognizing it's his house, and saunters right up. Kevin yelling, it's not his house, feeling that something isn't right. You got, you got that right, Kevin. He goes right up to the window, seeing his wife Lee inside, everyone wanting to leave, and they hightail it out of there. But before they get too far, they see someone across the way. The exact same group of people as them, but all with red glow sticks. Immediately upon noting the other groups, they run. They tell the others what they saw, admitting that it sounds pretty nuts. Mike pointing out the red sticks, meaning that this group opened the red box rather than the blue one. The groups, while similar, have each made slightly different choices throughout the evening. They also noticed a strange zone that's darker than the rest of the area. Amir and Hugh saying they ventured through the same thing themselves when they left. Left. this being the kind of barrier around where they are, and when passing through this area, travel into another reality. Asking Mike if he has any books on comets, he laughs he's an actor, so no. But Hugh remembers his brother left him a book in his car, which Kevin and Hugh go outside to retrieve, wondering if they should wake up a napping Lee. Coming back without incident, they flip through the book, and it begins to help us further piece together the idea of what's going on this very odd evening. Finding information on decoherence, as well as the shrill Schrodinger's cat thought experiment. The idea is that you have a cat in a closed box, along with a vial of poison. So without opening it, this means there's a 50-50 chance the cat is alive or dead. However, his brother Brian argues the concept of quantum reality. Opening the box collapses things into a single event. Until then, both possibilities of the cat being alive 
or dead or operating independently. The two states exist decoherent with each other, each creating a branch of reality based on the two possible outcomes. Quantum decoherence ensures that these realities do not interact with each other. Mike figuring out that they're the ones in the box, the comet having kind of broken this barrier between other realities. And once the comet passes, decoherence is maintained and the realities will go back to being separate and collapse, as they said. If this is the case, they then wonder why the other group is trying to contact them via the box, but realize the box wasn't meant for them. Already they have accidentally started collapsing themselves by going into the different realities and affecting things. Mike is like, ah, oh, well, we'll all collapse them first by going over there and killing them all. But cooler heads decide the right action is to return the box, a mere noting that they're not at war with the other people. Mike still thinks violence is the answer, even when pointing out how would he win in a fight against himself. But he considers that the other Mike might be drinking, and his drunken state of mind might be inspired to be the first one to come over and kill them. He recalls seeing Amir, Hugh, and Lee at the other house, but here Lee was asleep. So in the other reality, they consider perhaps it was Beth who was taking a nap, which means that they at that time don't have the book in the other house. Thusly, they aren't having the conversation this group is currently having, thinking that if they take the other's book, they can avoid any potential further problems. But everyone agrees they shouldn't mess with things any more than they already have, and annoyed Mike walking off. The girls think it might actually be a good thing, that they have a chance to meet ourselves and find ourselves, having the opportunity to physically find themselves, which is pretty bizarre to consider. That's a once in a lifetime opportunity, that is for sure. Taking Kevin aside, Mike has another idea to keep the others away from the book, to leave a note to blackmail his other self, a secret that he has, that he slept with Beth, which he wouldn't want to be revealed. Kevin thinks it's a terrible idea, but Mike says he knows himself well enough to know that this would work. Lee returns from her nap and appears a little woozy, a side effect as she took a dose of Beth's special tincture, and everyone starts thinking that perhaps she drugged the food. But she defensively says she would never do that, and even if she did, not only would it take a bottle of the stuff per person to cause hallucinations, but that still wouldn't explain them having a group hallucination. All having the same hallucination, it's not possible. And only now do we see that Hugh and Amir have red sticks, and they decide to take the book and box and leave. Mike comes in saying he tried to drop his note off at the house and saw their book. He thought of smashing the window in the car and taking it, but decided to not do it, and was going to wait and see the reaction, but freaked out and left instead, him saying he was gone for 45 minutes, Kevin clarifying that it was maybe 10 minutes tops, meaning that this is also a different Mike now as well. He goes to help himself to a drink, which it sounds like he's not supposed to do, and Amir and Hugh seize the opportunity to sneak out with a staff. The others come back noticing everything gone, and thinking back realize they've been acting weird since they came back. Again, they were not the same as the original duo that left, as we recall. Lori thinking that maybe they can't trust the other house, she laments that their clues are now gone too. But Emily figures out they must have these pictures, asking Mike to try and fetch them, him offering to fetch another bottle of wine. They are able to find them, including the specific ones of Emily and Kevin that have been cut in two, and she almost does the same thing, but ultimately decides not to. Meanwhile, Lori corners Kevin in the hall, asking if he's okay. He says he is, but she doesn't believe him, and asks about the work trip and Emily not going, calling it crazy that she's not going, trying to convince Kevin that he won't ever be happy with her, offering that some people do fit well together and goes in for a kiss. He stops her, and she apologizes for crossing so many boundaries. Well, yeah, not really the time to be making moves right now, lady. We've got multiple realities and doppelgangers and shit going on. Keep it in your pants for five minutes, please. Lee checks in on a now drunk Mike, thinking if he's losing it here, that he must be losing it over there as well. She's not sure it's the same thing, stating that there's no way anybody over there or anywhere else loves him as much as she does right here, him groaning that he fucked up. And keep in mind, this is still the original Lee since she hasn't left the house, same with Beth. Beth, who saw Kevin and Lori's hallway rendezvous tattles to Emily, and she attempts to confront Kevin about it, but he fibs that nothing happened, Beth is crazy, and that they have more important things to worry about, implying that Kevin, at least maybe in this reality, is kind of a jerk, possibly where Emily's hesitation in their relationship stems from. A loud crackle cuts the power again, and after lighting more candles, hear another sound like a car being broken into. 
everyone decides to go look and finds a window smashed in, but nothing was taken, each thinking that they should check their own cars. At Emily, she collects a ring from the glove box, startled by a knock on the window from Kevin asking if everything is okay. She says she wanted to put on the ring that he got her at the fair, even though it's cheesy, him smiling and remembering that was a good day. They patch things up after Lori and everything and have a nice hug. She asks about Hugh's car and if anything was taken, Kevin appearing befuddled like he doesn't know what she's talking about. And she comes back inside finding Kevin in there talking, meaning the one that she ran into outside is another different one than we were seeing here. Him asking where she was even though he would have just seen her moments ago. The group tries to figure out why the others would smash the window if the book isn't there, Beth thinking perhaps the book wasn't the motive. Interrupted by Hugh coming in, yet another one, who explains that he went to make the phone call, saw this in the house, and got startled, falling and hitting his head. Lori is confused, as he already told this story, and they got him a band-aid and everything, but Lee notices it is a different band-aid than the one they gave the previous one. Again, all proving this is yet another Hugh, and their actions are not occurring concurrently either, but with different variations for each reality. He continues that they left with the book and pictures, in a house with people with red sticks, confused as another pair of them were here earlier. Mike asked about the other Mike and how he's doing, being told he's worried about you, which is exactly how our Mike felt, and is now drinking just as he was worried the other one would do, that something's gonna not go right with all this Mike and drinking. Emily thinks that he must have left a note, but here he never got out with the note, now ending up with two notes, as did the others, one written and one on the door. Then wondering if it wasn't him or the other Hugh, then who left it? Mike questioning just how many Hugh and Amir's are running around here. Now starting to put together there's possibly an infinite number of Mike's house, rather than just one other. They elect to put out a marker and do exactly what the first group did as seen with making their lockbox. Now they are making their own, instead of a paddle going for a coaster and some other stuff as their random items, and use dice to assign numbers to each of the people, using a blue marker as they are the blue house, but whoops, they don't have any pictures of a mirror, so they have to take one, which looks similar to the first one, but not exactly, just as all the other realities are slightly different from each other. The point being, if they travel through the dark place, they can check for the box out front, and if they find this one, they'll know they made it back to their original location, even though they already totally went a bunch of other times and they're not going to be able to get back there. <laughs> Looking at the notebook, the numbers are written in green now, Emily asking the others what their original numbers were in the first box, and they don't match what's written now in the notebook. That's again because everyone except for Beth and Lee have left the house at some point, and thusly none of them are at their actual origin reality, calling the rest of the group visitors. There's more, finally figuring out Amir and Hugh's deal. They're from a third house, noticing that their phones aren't cracked. Continuing to get the picture of how things work, they recall the dark area, and basically whoever passes through this zone winds up in a kind of roulette wheel of sorts, ending up somewhere else by chance, getting flung out on the other side of the darkness, and not returning to the house that they left. Mike feels if this theory is true, which it is, then they should just stay here, as Kevin returns from burying their box, and here is something at the door, a note is scooted underneath, stating, Mike, my friend, with Beth, plus book equals Trinidad Club, warning, don't let it happen no matter what. Obviously, the blackmail note from another Mike, Beth enters looking rattled, brushing it off as nothing, and Hugh is alarmed, questioning if it's nothing, why does my wife have a nosebleed? Well, that's probably because she's been dosing on Special K all night seen several times spiking her wine with it. And the truth is spilled. 13 years ago, Mike and Beth slept together, intending to blackmail himself to not go get the book. Well, it's not really a bombshell because everyone knew about it, save for possibly the most important person, Hugh, who was obviously purposefully left in the dark about their infidelity. Mike tries to defuse the situation, as they don't belong here being visitors anyway, and tells Hugh to check if his phone is broken and it's not. Lori reminding that his was broken since the beginning, really proving that this isn't the original Hugh, which isn't really a surprise at this point either. They settle this definitively when asking what the item was that they put in their box. Hugh's saying that it was a stapler, but it was a paddle as we know, meaning that's not his Lee, not your Beth, and they're in a different reality. Hugh agrees in a huff because there's no way his best friend did sleep with his wife. Well, that did happen no matter which reality. Sorry, Hugh. Him being reminded even if there are five million different realities, Mike slept with Beth in every single one of them, which infuriates Hugh enough to pummel Mike 
bike to the ground. Mike goes on that he's stuck with the choices he's made, positing he spent the whole night worrying that there's a dark version of us out there somewhere, but what if they are the dark versions after all? Just as another Mike busts in the door and pummels this Mike, seeing he has a green glow stick, and quickly excuses himself as abruptly as he arrived. Emily goes to the door, finding another note attached, the original one that Hugh was going to leave, and casually leaves the still crazed others. She passes through the dark space. At the box out front, she finds a monkey stuffed animal thing, seeing her inside, and this group is using what looks like red glow sticks again, and continues to the next house. At the window, seeing here that they are all still arguing with each other. So she keeps walking to the next reality, where there are two mics tied up, with green and red sticks. Then another, where it appears that Lori and Kevin are together, so well that's not good. Next please. She looks up to the sky, noticing the comet changing trajectory, and goes on to the next house, hearing chattering and laughing, appearing much more jovial in this reality, the one where they're having a nice uneventful evening it seems. And here the electricity is still on, which for our group it was losing the power that was the catalyst for everything else that happened, including the omnipresent glow sticks. So without any of that happening, everyone stays pretty normal for the group, and Emily decides that this is the reality for her. She sneaks in the back door, snatching Beth's tincture, and quietly sneaks back out. The group interrupted by the sound of glass shattering, tying to the same event that occurred with our group previously. Hugh confused why they broke his windshield, but didn't take anything. It was all just a distraction by Emily, finding her other self at her car, where she gets the ring. This time our Emily gets the jump on her, knocking her unconscious with the drugs and throwing her in the trunk, then rejoining the others. Kevin asks if she's okay, her saying yeah, she was getting the ring, and everyone goes on to the patio to watch the comet, seeing it starting to break up, and the lights cut out momentarily, then come back on. With its destruction, this means decoherence has occurred, and the realities are collapsed back to being separate. But now our Emily, Emily Prime or whatever, is now effectively stuck here. Although the problem is there are now two Emilys in this reality. They get back to the conversation, and we learn in this reality, Emily did decide to join Kevin on his work trip, joking if Catherine was going to be her understudy while she's gone. Making it also sound like in this reality, Emily did end up performing her big aforementioned show, and wasn't usurped by Catherine in this version of things. So yeah, good choice on the reality there, girl. Emily Prime notices her doppelganger getting in the house, seeing her in the bathroom at the sink, and our Emily takes the top of the toilet and bashes her face in with it, dragging her into the bathtub. There's a knock at the door, being asked if she's okay, and having lost her ring in the fracas, takes the one off of her double, telling them that she'll be right out. She comes into the room and promptly falls to the ground and passes out, waking up the next morning on the couch, Lee in the midst of making some breakfast. Emily knowing that she needs to tend with her double, she's terrified, seeing the bathroom knob jiggling, but it's just Beth having finished taking a shower. Well, that's a relief, but it also means that at some point in the night, Emily too escaped. Outside, she sees the book is still inside Hugh's car in the envelope, and Kevin appears again asking if she's okay. Having found what is actually her ring on the bathroom floor, he then gets a call from Emily too to his confusion, and when answering, looks to Emily Prime, knowing that something is wrong here. Emily Prime has been exposed leading to no doubt further complications going forward. I mean, what can she do now? She'd have to kill her other self for good this time, and like single white female her life, I guess. And it looks like that's not going to be as easy as she thought. Oh well, you try to pick the best reality for you, and you just can't mess with that stuff without running into complications. That is the way it always goes. If you see a comet in the sky, stay inside, folks. That's the takeaway from this one. And that about wraps it up for this inning explain on coherence. Woo wee, things sure got complicated there. Kind of making my head hurt. You know, I really like this one, and it's admirable just how much of a grander epic story they were able to craft without much budget. And this definitely is a new indie sci-fi classic. Two thumbs up. Don't forget, before we go, you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you guys think of Coherence and its ending? Are there any other lingering questions that I missed? Would you try to hop realities like Emily did? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next time.